Thank you, uh, Philip, and thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be speaking at this uh, event. So a while back, Philip got in touch with me after I published this uh, article, a general audience piece in uh, Nautilus magazine that was about mimicry in artificial intelligence. So I'm a researcher uh, at Columbia University here in New York, and I work at the courses between computer science, cognitive science, and philosophy on various questions related to AI and how to gain a better understanding of uh, current algorithms that we call artificial intelligence, even though uh, we might want to debate whether they deserve this, this title or not. But this is an endless question in the history of AI. And I wrote this article to uh, speak um, a little bit further uh, to general audience about the recent trend in AI research um, and what it means, how we can interpret the capacities of current uh, AI algorithms, and what is the remaining remaining path to human-like intelligence. And so this is what we'll talk about today. Um, I apologize if some of the uh, technical background of this talk is very familiar to a lot of you. I know there are a lot of very technologically knowledgeable people in the audience. I have tried to, you know, try to keep keep the, the technological background to a minimum, but I will still give some background. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, by the way, all of the uh, images in this talk, aside from a few images, but almost all of the images are generated with uh, uh, deep neural networks, uh, including including this title one that I used in, in the Nautilus Magazine article to illustrate the, the article. Okay, so for the first um, 70 years also, also of, of uh, the history of AI research until recently, uh, the dominant approach has been, broadly uh, speaking, uh, a divide and conquer approach, uh, by and large, to AI research, where uh, researchers would try to tackle different questions related to different domains, uh, different tasks that could be automated by AI or different goals within AI research through different methods. Uh, the hope being that eventually you might be able to bridge uh, these different approaches together, but um, it has been uh, a goal that was mostly out of reach for a long time. So you would use different kinds of algorithms um, using different architectures, different techniques. Um, and uh, uh, you could build some systems that uh, use these different kinds of algorithms as modules, but uh, there was no unification of uh, various approaches to different problems in AI. And this is changing. And it's quite uh, remarkable how quickly is this is changing. Um, so uh, since the early 2010s, basically, um, deep learning, which uses the artificial neural networks loosely based on the human brain, have been taking over a lot of domains uh, of AI research, including computer vision, natural language processing, reinforcement learning, and, and other uh, domains. Uh, but uh, initially, these were still using diff very different architectures, different uh, learning functions, different uh, training data sets, and so on. Uh, and uh, there were various bottlenecks to progress in these different areas and to um, the unification of these different areas, including the availability of, of large data sets containing serialized data in various domains, text, vision, uh, action spaces for reinforcement learning, and so on. Um, but th these large data sets have been obtained through uh, crawling the internet for, for the most part uh, in, in the past 10 years. Um, language understanding has remained a huge hurdle initially, uh, and this is also a bottleneck that is being overcome now. And finally, we were lacking uh, a deep learning architecture uh, that is scalable and that benefits enormously from scaling up the size of the model and that can uh, be used with any kind of data as opposed to being specialized for a specific kind of data like, like images for computer vision or text for natural language processing. So as I mentioned, we are undergoing, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people working on AI, a kind of paradigm shift at the moment. Uh, and it can be traced back in some respects to uh, the invention of this new architecture called Transformer that dates back from 2017. It's quite surprising that this remains uh, the state of the art uh, in uh, a number of domains. Uh, even the vanilla Transformer architecture, uh, even without modifications, remain extremely powerful today in a field that uh, progresses extremely fast, 
this is quite noteworthy because five years in, in AI research is an eternity. Um, and basically, this uh, the creation of this architecture. I will say more about what it, what, how it works a little bit later. Um, it enabled the kind of one size fits all approach uh, to AI, where we can just take this architecture and apply it to a bunch of different problems, a bunch of different tasks, and a bunch of different uh, data, kinds of data, uh, not just uh, images or not just uh, text. Uh, importantly, it relies on a kind of learning. Uh, so all machine learning algorithms learn from data um, uh, in a way that is not guided by uh, human-made uh, rules. But uh, traditionally, machine learning algorithms were learning in a supervised fashion. You had to manually label uh, samples in a data set, like manually la label images for a classifier, for example. Um, and these new uh, algorithms uh, based on the transformer architecture are self-supervised, so they don't require this uh, hand-labeled approach, which enables researchers to work with uh, huge data sets that are not manually labeled in the same way. So you, can, you get much, uh, it's much easier to train your algorithms on, on a, a huge data sets. Um, and the architecture is also very scalable to very large models. Um, models that uh, nowadays are so large and that's around so much data that they actually cost millions of dollars to train. Um, and these models can be pre-trained on these very large data sets that are obtained by crawling the web. Um, and they can be pre-trained through this self-supervised learning objective um, in such a way that after pre-training, uh, they can be applied to a bunch of different downstream tasks that they haven't been specifically trained for. So we have this phenomenon um, called um, uh, in-context learning, where after being trained on these huge data sets, these algorithms can uh, uh, adapt to different tasks without having explicitly been trained on these for these tasks. Uh, and they're also applicable, these transformer-based algorithms are applicable to any kind of serialized data. As we'll see, it's not just text anymore, it's not just images anymore, it includes videos and it even includes uh, uh, action data like like button presses or, or join talks for robots. So as long as you can serialize the data as a series of discrete data points, uh, then you can train your algorithm, the transformer algorithm on this kind of data. Uh, and for most of them, they have this universal training uh, or learning objective, which is uh, predicting the next token, the next data point that follows from this the preceding sequence of tokens. Uh, for text, they will be predicting the word that flows from a sequence of words. For images, they will be predicting the next image patch that flows from a series of patches of images. Um, or you can do it with individual pixels, but it doesn't work as well. And you can do that with all the kinds of serialized data. And finally, one theme that's emerging in this line of research, uh, in all of AI research really, is that uh, language can be used as a kind of universal interface also between models. You can train several of these models, some on uh, videos, some on images, some on, on text alone, uh, and you can interface them uh, through uh, uh, natural language, using natural language as kind of a universal API to have algorithms talk to each other. So here is an example of uh, a statement of that paradigm shift uh, from Andrei Karpathy, who until recently was the head of AI research at Tesla, uh, recently uh, uh, left Tesla. Um, and I won't read you the whole, I mean, it's, it's a whole thread, but this is essentially making the same point that there is this incredible consolidation in AI at the moment across all of these different domains where uh, this transformer-based approach has uh, kind of led to a convergence of domains that traditionally were uh, very uh, dissimilar and didn't talk to each other that much. So there's a whole family of these, I call them large pre-trained models, because I think that's the most neutral label for these um, transformer-based large models that are pre-trained on a lot of data. Uh, some researchers from Stanford uh, have called them foundation models, and it's kind of a controversial label because um, a foundation sounds like foundational, and for various reasons, including some we'll talk about today, uh, we might want to resist the um, uh, temptation to, to, to think of these labels of, as foundational leads us to read too much into what they do. So I just call them large protein models because whatever we think about what they can do, this is a good, I think, neutral label for them. 
So there is a large family of these models nowadays. And basically, it's all happening in the industry because you need a lot of resources to train these models and universities simply cannot comp compete anymore uh, in terms of budget and, and logistics um, to train these large models. So uh, the first uh, breakthroughs were uh, obtained in natural language processing with these large language models, which are just large pre-trained models based on the transformer architecture uh, that are only trained on text, on a huge corpus, huge corpora of text, including uh, all of English Wikipedia, thousands of books, millions of web pages. Uh, the first breakthrough was, uh, well, one of the first uh, was from OpenAI, especially with a GPT-3 uh, model that was unveiled in 2020. And since then, basically every big lab in the industry has been training these humongous uh, large uh, language models. Uh, but now we also have vision language models, including all of the models that have used to produce the images you will see in these, in these slides. Um, DALI 2 from OpenAI uh, is one that made the headlines, uh, and now you have a host of other models. Some of them are uh, available in open access, like stable diffusion. Others are not available, like Imogen, Party, and Flamingo. We even have video language models, uh, models that can generate videos. So both um, both vision language models and video language models can be queried with text, um, which is the language part. Uh, so again, language as a universal API is the theme here. Uh, and you can generate images or videos using text descriptions. And finally, we have more, even more generalist models that can uh, uh, output actions in the, in the form of, for example, keyboard presses or button presses uh, to play video games, for example. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, examples in this technology. And I apologize if you're very familiar with this already, but I want to give you enough background. So here are examples of images generated with some of these uh, vision language models, multimodal uh, algorithms. Um, here with DALI2 and with Imogen, the, image, the images at the top were produced by me with DALI2 of, of animal hybrids. You can see it can combine concepts with uh, a, a quite a remarkable uh, fluency uh, and compositionality. Um, in the way which it, it, it combines features of different concepts together. And similarly, in the, in the, the bottom here, these are images, images produced with Imagen, which is uh, another similar algorithm from Google that is not available uh, in open access. Um, here, combining the concept of Great Wall or Great Wall of China with different locations. Uh, there is a uh, very rapid progress in that domain, uh, especially with things like compositional understanding. So here you can see a very complex text prompt at the bottom, a wombat sits in a yellow beach chair while sipping a martini that is on his laptop keyboard. The wombat is wearing a white Panama hat and a floral Hawaiian shirt out of focus palm trees in the background. So there's a lot going on here. It's quite a complex uh, prompt to understand. Um, in in Petrolite has a complex syntax and a lot of different objects and, and, and features that need to be bound together and composed together appropriately by the model. And you can see that DALI 2 on the left here does not do very well. I mean, it gets some of it right, and the images are uh, visually quite realistic, but they, they lack uh, a lot of the uh, compositional understanding that is required to properly illustrate that prompt. Uh, some objects are missing, and some features are bound to the wrong objects. And on the right here, you have this, uh, the same prompt uh, with uh, Party, which is an algorithm from Google. Uh, that basically nails it, uh, basically is able to produce a, a perfectly uh, uh, adequate um, illustration of that prompt. So there is very fast progress even within this, this family of models. Uh, what we are seeing now emerging, this is very cutting edge work, uh, is uh, the generation of, of videos, these are very short videos, but um, it's fast, it's rapidly progressing. So videos from text descriptions, and uh, this is the next frontier, and probably in the next year or two, uh, you will get much more uh, compelling, long, and high-resolution examples of this. And finally, now we have models like Gato on the left here that can do all of this together, generating images, generating text, text, generating videos, but also playing video games because it was also trained uh, on button presses. And even, uh, as you see on the top left, uh, uh, using uh, controlling a real robotic arm to move real objects because it, will, it was also trained on joint talks uh, as serialized data. On the top left, you have uh, 
vision pre-trained uh, pre-training from OpenAI, which is playing the game Minecraft here. It was also trained on button presses and videos, so it's also a kind of agent. And on the bottom left here, you have Seikan from Google, which uh, basically is a language model that is plugged into a robot with a camera that can actually perform actions in the real world based on natural language instructions. You can give it an instruction like pick up a specific object uh, in uh, a drawer and it can actually navigate the real world and do that. So it's easy to be impressed um, when we see this kind of recent developments, but I think it's also important to resist our natural tendency for anthropomorphism and not ascribe uh, too much or too many high-level sophisticated human-like capacities to these models. Uh, there have been, a lot, has been a lot of hype in media, a lot of misleading headlines. Uh, the most recent story was that of this Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne, uh, who became convinced that the chatbot, uh, which is essentially a large language model designed at uh, Google internally called Lambda, was sentient. And, uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of AI experts uh, think this is completely ludicrous uh, and regrettable. And in fact, Blake Lemoyne himself uh, mentioned that this is because of his religious beliefs that he came to that conclusion. But it's hard to resist this tendency of anthropomorphism. And I will come back to that at the end. But it's important to understand that Essentially, all of these algorithms, and I'm simplifying here, are trained uh, with a single objective, which is next token prediction. So here in the uh, linguistic domain, you have a sequence of text, and you want to predict whatever word uh, follows from that sequence of texts. Um, so the models are trained on uh, by sampling sequences of text over and over and over in the training data, trying to predict what word uh, statistically is the most likely to follow from the sequence. And then the error, uh, 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 when it's compared, when you compare the predicted word to the actual word that flows from the sequence, is back propagated through the neural network to adjust the parameters of the network. And you do this millions of times, and over time, uh, the model becomes very good, becomes very good at uh, predicting whatever token flows from the sequence of tokens. You can do this with text, you can do this with images, you can do this with videos, and again, you can do this with actions. So back when GPT-3 in 2020 was unveiled, I wrote this general piece for Nautilus um, about the notion of, of bullshit uh, that is uh, using bullshit here as a technical term. So the philosopher Harry Frankfurt wrote this essay on bullshit that is quite interesting. Um, and he defines a technical notion of bullshit that essentially uh, refers to speech that is produced with the sole intention to be compelling or to convince without any intrinsic regard for truth or falsity. So the bullshitter is someone who's not trying to say the truth, but not necessarily trying to deceive either, just trying to produce compelling speech for the sake of it. And uh, what I argued in that piece essentially is that GPT-3 was an expert artificial bullshitter. So it's excellent at next token prediction. So excellent at producing compelling speech uh, that uh, is as close as possible to uh, what a, how a human might have completed a sequence of text. But there is no intrinsic regard for truth or falsity in these algorithms. There is no intrinsic goals, intrinsic desires, intrinsic beliefs, uh, and nothing like a personality. And um, I'm not the only one to have uh, raised the alarm about potential anthropomorphic interpretations of these models. There's this very influential paper that came out uh, a couple of years back, or, uh, a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, uh, from including uh, various people, including two ethicists at Google who were subsequently fired. There was a whole drama around this, Tunic Gebru and, and Margaret Mitchell, um, who compared these large language models to stochastic powers um, and said essentially that um, we should be careful not to attribute any actual understanding of language to these models that just haphazardly sticking together, stitching together sequences from the training data. Um, like parrots who just repeat Kant's sentences without really understanding what that means. The problem is that I think this stochastic parrots metaphor goes too far uh, in the other direction. It's good to have some skepticism or, or, or remain critical of the more uh, anthropomorphic uh, uh, claims that have been made about these models, but I think it's unfair to reduce them to something like stochastic parrots. Uh, large pretend models do more than just memorizing sequences from the training data. They actually create novel outputs, and this has been now well established. 
uh, whether it's in, in the visual domain or uh, in the linguistic domain, uh, they can create generally novel outputs. I've just shown you some examples of this. Um, and they can compose features of the training that are in novel ways as well. I've also shown you some examples of this. Uh, they don't just excel as, at plagiarism. Uh, they also excel as, at pastiche. You can uh, get them to create images in the style of a, of a specific painter or a specific visual uh, style. Or you can get them to generate text in the style of a particular author or in a, uh, a particular style. So I wrote recently this new article that, that prompted this whole uh, exchange with Philip and, and my uh, talking today um, that tries to go beyond this metaphor of the stochastic parrot. And essentially I propose here to go uh, from parrot to stochastic parrot to stochastic chameleons because I think the metaphor is more apt. So large pre-trained models do not just repeat CANs uh, sequences from the training data. They actually blend in their environments, where the environment here is given by a prompt, typically a text prompt, uh, a little bit like chameleon or cephalopods can blend in their environment with the specialized cells to uh, adapt to the colors of the environment. So the way in which these animals do that is that they sample colors from the environment with these chromatophores, the specialized cells, and then they can change the colors of the skin. Um, and uh, these large models, they don't sample colors like that, but they sample uh, the latent space, which is the large vector space uh, uh, in, uh, that um, is created by training them on all of this data. And they can find uh, within the latent space uh, the, uh, the region that is appropriate to perform whatever task is specified in a prompt that you give them, whether it's generating text or images and other things. And so they can induce statistically salient properties of the training data to flexibly mimic human outputs. And I think this notion of artificial mimicry is more helpful than uh, that of uh, a parrot just uh, mindlessly uh, repeating sequences from the training data. So here's an example of such mimicry. I just chatted before uh, giving this talk with this uh, uh, other chatbot from Meta AI, formerly Facebook, um, that is available to talk to at blenderbot.ai. Um, and, you know, we had a real conversation. This is just an extract. Uh, but you can see that it's quite good at mimicking what a human might say in a conversation about a topic here I was talking about it this very talk. Uh, but language models, uh, even the models that are just trained on text, not even on images, can go further. Uh, here is an example of a language model from Google called Palm, uh, that is the state of the art at the moment, uh, explaining a joke. And not, a, not just explaining a joke, but explaining an anti-joke and uh, uh, accurately explaining that it is funny because uh, it's an anti-joke. And again, this is a joke that was not present in the training data. The researchers uh, at Google came up with that joke to test the model. Um, and so that is quite remarkable. Um, and you have other startling behavior, models, like uh, this kind of uh, uh, common sense reasoning example. Uh, Jennifer looked out a window and sees a really cool cloud below her. She unbuckles her seat belt and heads to the bathroom. Is Jennifer probably traveling more than 300 miles per hour relative to the Earth? Uh, and you can see that the model here appropriately deduces that uh, Jennifer is probably on a plane. And so the answer is probably yes. Um, in the interest of time, I had a brief explanation of how the transformer architecture works here, but I will just keep this. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Um, it's not fundamental. Uh, so when you see such uh, impressive behavior for this model, I think we are now starting to see emergent behavior, emergent capacities, and I can say more about this in the Q&A, but start to go beyond even mimicry. Uh, so we're certainly beyond parroting, uh, but we're starting to go even beyond mimicry. Um, and part of the issue is that here is that sufficiently advanced mimicry is indistinguishable from genuine intelligence. Uh, when Chameleons adapt to the environments, they can do so mindlessly. They don't have to, to analyze purposefully and intentionally the environments to change their colors. This all happens through a mindless uh, mechanism, sampling the colors through the special cells and changing the colors of the skin. Um, so mimicry can happen mindlessly, but um, sufficiently advanced mimicry is hard to distinguish from general intelligence. Uh, and large pretend models are already acquiring these non-trivial capacities that uh, some of which I already mentioned. 
So I think to make headway in this debate on whether these models are mere powers, whether they achieve some more advanced form of mimicry, which I think is, is beyond dispute at this point, and whether they actually are uh, reaching beyond mimicry now towards genuine human-like intelligence and human-like cognitive capacities, we need to do two things. On the one hand, we need to sharpen our definitions of terms like intelligence, understanding, reasoning, and others, which are very polysemous terms. Uh, and there is a long tradition in philosophy of analyzing and defining these terms. And I think here, computer science can benefit from uh, looking back at some uh, work in uh, the philosophy of cognitive science, empirically minded philosophy. Um, but we also need a better mechanistic understanding of the computations carried out by large creature models. There is very exciting work being done uh, by people like Chris Ola at Anthropic AI, a new startup in the Silicon Valley, uh, trying to reverse engineer uh, what these models are doing, the very kind of computations they are uh, implementing. Uh, because, because these models are like black boxes, uh, but uh, through clever reverse engineering with toy models, you can actually realize that they are starting to implement things that look more and more like symbolic computations and manipulations of variables, for example. And I think that's quite exciting to really understand what they're doing. I want to finish by just mentioning some of the more practical and ethical implications uh, of this kind of consideration. Um, this is a, 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 an event on, on virtual beings, um, and they are uh, various companies that are trying to uh, create uh, avatars that uh, humans can talk to. Um, and I think we need to uh, be quite careful in the way this is done and do it in an ethical way, uh, because uh, there are two different issues here. I think on the one hand, we have a tremendous tendency for anthropomorphism. Uh, at the bottom here, you have uh, comments on Reddit from a user of Replica, this uh, startup that gives you an AI companion or uh, claims to uh, provide you with an AI companion, which can be even a romantic partner, according to them, that you can talk to. Uh, and you can see that people are very prone to ascribing beliefs, desire, goals, personalities, and human-like mental states to these, uh, uh, to these uh, companions that are based on these transformer-based uh, large language models that don't really have any intrinsic goals, desires, or anything like that. Uh, they can have a makeshift personality, but they don't have a genuine personality in the same way uh, as we humans do, that is based on beliefs, desires, a theory of mind, and these uh, human-like traits. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, you also have a tendency for uh, dehumanizing uh, uh, um, behavior when talking to robots that are acknowledged as robots. So it's kind of paradoxical, but on one hand, you have people uh, ascribing human-like traits to these robots. But on the other hand, as you can see in this article, on abuse, verbally abusing these AI companions, uh, some people feel uh, compelled to behave in ways that they wouldn't necessarily behave, uh, uh, behave uh, in with humans. Uh, and I worry that eventually this might lead to degradation of online speech uh, or just interactions between humans themselves, uh, because uh, some people might feel uh, uh, kind of uh, authorized to um, suggest that whoever they're talking to online is actually a robot and uh, dehumanize them for this reason. So I worry about the two different uh, uh, strands of this ethical conundrum, both humanizing some uh, uh, algorithms that are not very human-like in the way they work and dehumanizing humans based on interactions with these algorithms. So we'll stop here, but I'm very happy to uh, discuss all of these topics during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Love the concepts. Um, we're a little short on time, but I'd like to ask you a quick question, uh, meaning of life question. Um, uh, in her book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill talks about non-human recognizable errors. Uh, is there any discussion among your colleagues of non-human recognizable intelligence? Could there be intelligence out there? We're just not seeing it because we don't know what to look for. Yeah, I mean, that's part of, I think, the, the, the tricky um, problem we're facing now with this large pretend models is that uh, we don't really know yet what kind of computations they are. Uh, implementing. There is this ongoing work of mechanistic interpretability that I've mentioned, trying to reverse engineer 
uh, the specific kind of completions they're implementing. Uh, but so long as we not we don't have this kind of uh, fully worked out uh, model of how uh, after they're trained, what they're actually able to carry out in terms of computations, we can only rely on the behavior and testing them and what we know about the architecture. And so right now we have uh, uh, people are very polarized. We have the hardline skeptics saying that they're really no smarter than Toaster and they're really not doing anything, uh, you know, that should be really remarkable or impressive. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, people hyping up these models, either journalists or some people in the industry or some people who just don't know how they work. And I, I in, in my work, I try to find a, a healthy, reasonable middle ground to these two extremes. I think uh, they are not quite yet human-like and uh, there are various ways in which uh, we could perhaps make them more human-like. The present, uh, presentation in that was interesting in that respect, looking at uh, interactivity, looking at lifelong learning, continual learning, this kind of thing as potential avenues uh, to build more human-like algorithms. Um, but uh, so there are ways in which they are not yet human-like. They don't have the kind of mental states that we have. Uh, they don't interact and engage with the world in the ways we do. Um, but on the other hand, they uh, are starting to do things that do look like reasoning and do look like inklings of intelligence. And we, do, we need to acknowledge this and we need to investigate this further. So could there be intelligence that is not recognized by, by humans? Uh, I think in some ways, yes, at least intelligence, inklings of intelligence that is not acknowledged by uh, the hardline skeptics. Um, but we need to do more work to investigate this with careful uh, uh, reverse engineering.